there's nothing wrong with ambition. And, and there's nothing wrong with setting a long-term goal. I think there, there is a problem with setting an unrealistic timeline. Mm. Because if you make an unrealistic timeline, then you um, inherently disappoint the people that should be supporting it. So if we told everybody we're going to be on Mars within two years, mm. and then two years came and went and we still weren't on Mars, um, why would anybody believe us or support us? You don't know John Young, but he flew the first flight of Gemini, he did the first flight of the lunar lander on Apollo 10. He landed on the moon on Apollo 16 and walked on the moon. And he did the first flight of the space shuttle. John Young says something regularly, which I think is great. He says, Mars is further away than most people think. <laughs> and John knows, because he's walked on the moon. Uh, Mars, a lot of the time, is on the other side of the sun from us. It is immensely far away. And, and, and the distance between us and Mars in time with the engines we have right now is like six months. Just if things go perfectly, it's going to take six months to get there. If we started going to Mars anytime soon, everybody would die on every single flight. We don't know what we're doing yet. We have to have a bunch of inventions between now and Mars. So I think it's a fine long-term destination. But what we're learning on the space station right now is absolutely pivotal to go to Mars. How to store your food. How much food do you need? How does the body process food after months in weightlessness? Um, how do you keep the body healthy? How do you not have your bones degrade? How do you not go crazy? How do you communicate? And then, and once we get away from the world, how do you navigate? And when the communication becomes so slow because of the distances. And how do you uh, protect yourself from the radiation? Because close to the Earth, we got the magnetic field. It's like a, like a force field protects us. Going through the Van Allen belts and then into pure um, interplanetary space, the radiation, we don't even know what effect it has on the human body. If we go to the moon, we're only three days away. As soon as we have fired those engines, so we're going 12 kilometers a second or faster, we can't turn around. We, we won't have the fuel to slow down to zero and then accelerate to come back. We have to go all the way to Mars just to use the, the gravity of Mars, if we had a real problem, to slingshot around and come back to Earth. So as soon as we fire those engines, we are committed to a year in space minimum, no matter what fails. We're going to be on the space station for the next 15 years, and then that same sort of international consortium that has allowed us to build and, and peaceably build a space station we should include China, and we should include India, and we should have a permanent base on the moon, just like we've done in Antarctica for the last 50 years. And then, and, and not as the main effort of the world, but as one of the things we're doing. We'll learn so much about the planet from seeing it from the moon permanently, because it's a wonderful observatory, and on the other side, to understand the universe without the atmosphere in the way. And once we've tested and invented new engines, then we'll go to Mars. In my right hand, you can see I'm holding a big drill called the uh, pistol grip tool. And in the middle of the arm, I had to do up these big expandable diameter fasteners to make the arm rigid. And I was working away, and suddenly something went into my left eye that made it just sting like crazy. It, it was as if, you know, the worst painful chemical had just gotten in your eye, and it's screaming and it's tearing. Our eyes are a beautifully evolved design under gravity, right? You have your tear duct right up here, and it's a modified sweat gland, and it flows this weird chemical of oils and seawater and everything down into your eye. And then the, the duct in here picks up that and drains it out your nose, and that's why your nose runs when you cry. But it also, if you, tear if you cry a lot, it runs down your face, as everybody knows. Unless there's no gravity, in which case, your tear duct squirts out all this stuff, and, and continues to squirt like uh, dilutant into your eye, but it doesn't go anywhere. Uh, unlike Sandra Bullock, where hers came squirting out of her eye. It's like, who wrote that movie? Anyway, um, and so the tear got big enough that it went across this little bridge of the nose and went into my other eye. Great. So now both eyes were blind. So that when this picture was taken, I had called down to Houston and said, hey, Houston, I have a problem. Um, I, I can't see. Some, there's, there's contaminant in my suit. The way we get the carbon dioxide out is a filter on our back. It uses a chemical, lithium hydroxide, that soaks up the carbon dioxide. Uh, but lithium hydroxide's nasty stuff. And if it 
um, somehow breaks through its little seals and you get a squirt of lithium hydroxide in, the first symptom is really bad eye irritation and the second symptom is like permanent lung damage. So Houston's going, hmm, hope it's not lithium hydroxide. Here's what we want you to do. We want you to open up the purge valve on the side of your helmet. You can just sort of see it on the left side where my left ear would be there. Open up your purge valve and start squirting your oxygen out into space, please. <laughs> so I couldn't see, but I'd practiced it many times. Reached up, you sort of push it in, turn it 90 degrees and pop it out. And then I'm in the universe, holding onto a ship, blind, listening to as my limited supply of oxygen is, is, is squirting out of my suit through a little hole. And it turned out to be just the anti-fog, the chemical that we used to wipe and, and polish on the inside of our visor was a mixture of oil and, and sort of this strong soap, because that's nice for an anti-fog. So now we use uh, Johnson's No More Tears, <laughs> which we, we probably should have been using, you know, since the beginning. Would have been, would have been a better choice, I think. The first time you go around the world, uh, you are just like anybody else the first time seeing something. You want to look for stuff you recognize. And you actually sort of point out to yourself the places that you've been. Probably everybody here at some point has said, go to that Facebook app or something and said, which countries have I been to? And stuck a little virtual pin into those. Say, like, these countries have significance because I was there. <laughs> right? That, I don't know why else we do that. I do that. I, I, and. And uh, you feel that way in space. And in fact, you want to grab one of the other astronauts and go, hey, look, that's where my high school graduation was, right there, look, look, look. And the other person goes, yeah, hey, nice. Um, and then the second time you come around the world, you go, oh yeah, that's where my high school graduation was. And then the third time come around, you go, wow, look, look at the Great Lakes. I had no idea that's how they looked. And then the fourth time around, you're going, holy cow, look at James Bay. You can see where the glaciers receded for the last 15,000 years. And the fifth time around, you start to see the whole world. And the 500th time around, you see the whole world as one place. It's inevitable. It seeps right into you. And to answer your question, um, every single person in this room, probably right now, whether you've thought about it or not to yourself, you have some circle that is us and you have everybody outside of that little Venn diagram circle that is them. There's, there's an us and them in your life. Like if something, right now, they are getting pounded in the Philippines by an enormous typhoon, and almost a million people have evacuated. But f for most of us in this room, all those people in the Philippines are them, and it's not really affecting you. And so even though it's in a tremendous number of people in distress, imagine if that were happening right here, it's beyond the line of us and them. And so you don't fret about it. You might not even think about it. You might not even know about it. You might not even know where the Philippines are because it's them. Um, if you came on board the spaceship with me and did, we did 100 orbits together, that line starts to disappear. You have to let people see the whole world for what it truly is because you can focus on your little square of pavement or sand or, or whatever and, and think that that's the only part that matters just like your, your great, great, great grandparents did. Or you can start to see the world as one place where we are all in this together. As soon as we can start to see ourselves that way, we will advance tremendously. But it's, it's, it's a tough process. And, uh, and we have years and years and centuries of traditions that, are, that work against it. But it's getting better, I think. And, uh, and um, hopefully, uh, through continued education, influence, travel, and communication, we can... Uh, we can treat each other better.